Your commentator is Robert Stevenson. America goes to war. Men of the Army, Navy, and Marines reinforce the battlefronts on six continents to save the homes and ideals of free men from Axis domination. In Ireland, United States fighting men, who have safely crossed the submarine-infested Atlantic, strengthen their ever-increasing ranks. Yanks on the march on Irish South. The worldwide conflict brings intrepid American airmen to China's heroic fighting front. General Chenault, United States Air Force Chief in China, flies with his brave command to strike effective blows at the invading Japs. Later, with Colonel Scott, he observes his men in action. 10,000 miles from home, men and supplies pour in through India, the last doorway to China. Cheerful yet determined, welcome strangers in a strange land. the coast of Alaska, jutting sharply into the Pacific and the slate gray Bering Sea, lie the bleak Aleutian Islands. Here, Jap airmen bomb American soil and ships. Here, our defenders seek the enemy, determined to drive him from American shores. Destroyers guard transports and cargo ships to land troops and supplies on a fog-swept island near the enemy-held Kiska. Men, stores, and ammunition pour in for the Battle of the Illusions, a battle that Americans must win. American naval guns open up on the Jap-held Solomon Islands. Guadalcanal, United States Marines in a swift surprise invasion add new glories to the fighting career of their illustrious corps. The retreating Japs attempt to destroy their newly completed air base. It is quickly captured by the Leathernecks and renamed Henderson Field. The Marines, later reinforced by army troops, battle fiercely to hold their ground. Some of the enemy escape in a hurry. Others get out of the fight as prisoners. History recorded as it happened. The Marines are the first to raise the American flag on enemy territory. Seeking out and blasting Hitler's U-boats is the rough, tough job of naval aviators and men of the Coast Guard. Hundreds of ships, including vitally needed tankers, are hit, burned, and sunk, victims of prowling enemy submarines. American waters become a battlefront. In the Caribbean, more ships run off all the enemy fire, but greater combat action gets results as convoys steam through to their destinations. Russia meets the grim test. Despite repeated attacks by crushing panzer units, pushing on desperately toward the Caucasus and into the streets of Stalingrad, Marshal Semyon Timoshenko's relentless armies take a terrific toll of the enemy and upset his invasion timetable. The Russians meet the Nazis in close and often hand-to-hand -hand fighting. A German sniper is picked off by a Soviet sharpshooter. Another Nazi tries to surrender, but too late. Britain's Prime Minister flies to Moscow. Eyes and ears the world over are focused on a conference of historic importance. Churchill meets Stalin behind the walled fortress of the Kremlin.
Rio de Janeiro, nerve center of the largest country in South America, is the scene of a history-making demonstration. All-out war is declared as a result of the ruthless Axis attacks on Brazilian ships and an appalling loss of lives. Brazil goes to war. Silk-like mists blanket a lifeless channel as a strong force of fearless Canadians accompanied by British, American and Free French breathlessly await daybreak in the grim job ahead. The job of invading the German-held French coast. Dieppe is their battle objective and the hardy Canadians and their allies have been training for months for the dangerous hour and task. RAF and American bombers soften up inland German positions in a true coordination of land, sea and air hitting power. Down goes wave after wave of bombs, the din of battle in the air, on land and from the sea, reaches a terrific crescendo. For nine hours, the Canadians battled fiercely on Nazi-held and fortified soil. They leave the coast of France in flames. Their objective obtained, these battle-scarred heroes disembark for a well-earned rest. Filmed under fire, the ever-growing British and American air might rains destruction upon French-held ports and over the Reich itself. United Nations flyers maintain daylight raids with constantly increasing frequency. Enemy munition plants are sent skyward. Dock installations and rail centers are hit again and again. Air prelude to the Allied Second Front to come. Official United States Navy pictures of Japan's first great naval defeat. At Mid-Pacific, Midway Island, American planes and warships strike a punishing surprise blow that the Japs will never forget. Their invasion plans are scuttled as the Yankees take a telling toll. Four Jap carriers sunk, 28 Jap battleships and cruisers sunk or put out of action, and more than 300 Jap planes destroyed. Enemy airmen try desperately to fight off the unexpected assault, but all in vain. A few escape our furious air and sea barrage. Most of them are destroyed. Six months after Pearl Harbor, and for three hot, sunlit days, the Battle of Midway rages. Here, a Jap surprise invasion meets with a counter-surprise by American forces. The concussion of bursting bombs is deafening as Jap planes drop their eggs of destruction, only to be met by a hail of hot steel. Steel made in the USA to destroy Japs. Heroic Marine gunners stick to their posts and let the enemy have it. Jap planes fall by the hundreds, fall like blazing torches. Flames consume the wreckage of other planes that fail to get through. The Red Cross heroically cares for the scorched and wounded. Midway's oil tanks explode, sending forth a curtain of dense smoke that casts a deep shadow over the battleground below. Smoke and burning oil tanks cloud the skies over Midway as reveille sounds on the third day of the struggle. Amidst this scene of destruction and bravery, the Marines proudly raise the emblem of freedom, the flag of victory. Midway was ready. A momentous victory is won. Your commentator is Fulton Lewis, Jr. The 
grim struggle to clear the Atlantic sea lanes goes on. Crushing sea and air weapons of the American, English, and Canadian navies blast Nazi wolf packs that continue to harass the Allied traffic lanes. A slinking raider comes to the surface and is sighted. Unaware of impending danger, the new boat moves in for the kill. The veteran crew of a United States Coast Guard cutter attacks. But the submarine fires its last telling shot. heroes day by day send more of Hitler's undersea marauders to the bottom. Another U-boat has just been sunk. What remains of its crew struggles for life. Often they perish, but sometimes they surmount the rigors of surging seas and are picked up by Allied warcraft. Their next stop is an internment camp. The fatal end of what once was one of the world's largest navies. The French fleet fails to heed the plea of the Allies to escape to North Africa, but to prevent the mighty armada from falling into Hitler's hands, the fleet is scuttled. Magnificent dreadnoughts, cracked cruisers, mighty submarines are burned and blown up before the very eyes of the infuriated Nazis. The fleet dies that France may live again. Nineteen forty-one, the United States Navy seizes the mighty French liner Normandy. 1942, fire destroys the once proud queen of the Atlantic. 1943, the greatest ship salvage operation of all time begins. The Normandy rises again, a new symbol of hope for the France that will rise again. American air power blasts the Japs from the skies and the island strongholds of the South Pacific. In the Solomons, Jap transports are sunk almost as fast as they appear. General Douglas MacArthur personally commands the terrific struggle to annihilate the barbarous Japs. Again and again, our paratroopers harass the sons of the setting sun. The fighting general flies into battle with our intrepid airmen. Objective reached, the paratroopers bail out. The first four-star general to lead a sky attack. Continuous airborne invasions throughout the South Pacific place MacArthur's men in the rear of the Japs. Their escape is made impossible. Land forces fighting for every inch of ground trap thousands of Japs in dense tropical jungles. The Mikado's little monkey men are trapped in furious attacks on air bases. Treacherous Jap snipers are burned alive by infuriated natives. These sons of heaven decide to remain on earth for another bowl of rice. On the North Burma front, the veteran Lieutenant General Joe Stilwell moves in with his American trained and equipped Chinese forces, fighting incessantly to hold vital positions on the Salween River until Burma can be retaken. Here, an almost forgotten front in the global war ties down a big Japanese army. Once defeated by the Japs in Burma, General Stilwell fights on and trains a growing army to reconquer it. The city of Buenos Aires roars with disorder and rioting as the army overthrows the government of Ramon Castillo. Axis sympathizes. The overwhelming majority of the Argentine people seek closer hemispheric ties, but against their will and mandate, the army takes them from the frying pan into the fire. At 
Casablanca, President and Prime Minister, salute the men who fight and must win this war. The unconditional surrender of the Axis is planned and perfected by the Joint Military High Command. Surrender of Tripoli brings Mussolini's North African Empire to an end. General Montgomery's heroic army chases Rommel's Africa Corps from the gates of Egypt. Churchill flies to Tripoli to hail the glorious achievement of Montgomery's fighting 8th Army. The desert battle heroes cheer the symbol of the Allies' will to win. Under American General Dwight D. Eisenhower, battle-tested Americans, British, Canadians, and French leap from Tunisia to Sicily. Losses from Nazi sky raiders failed to stop Eisenhower's push toward Hitler's fortress Europe. Off Salerno, the United States cruiser Savannah suffers a direct bomb hit. A turret is knocked out and there are casualties in the gun crew. The Savannah's heroic men continue to shell the beach as the American Fifth Army invades Italy. Italy surrenders. Salerno is won. Allied armies march on Naples and Rome to tear down the double cross of continental Europe. The invasion of Italy weakens Nazi strength on the Russian front. Americans and Canadians capture Italian towns street by street. Naples is taken. All Nazi Germany trembles with every Allied advance to the north, certain to bring vast new areas of the Hitler homeland more and more within reach of crushing air bombardment. Terror grips every German city when British and American bombers roar over those white cliffs of Dover and cross the channel to the coast of conquered France. The shattering air offensive reaches a terrific peak such as the world has never known. The staggering weight of the growing American air power hastens the day of victory. offensive, sustained a tremendous tempo for months, the avenging Red Armies sweep the Nazis out of the Ukraine and into a catastrophe that shakes all Germany to her sinister foundation. They shoot down counter-attacking Nazis with savage joy. The passionate fury of the Soviets is symbolized by the flaming banner of fire and steel under which they fight. Here on the crimson Russian steppes of the Dnieper River bend, Hitler's hordes are annihilated as powerful red spearheads seal the fate of thousands of German troops. Mopping up back of the advancing armies, a Russian soldier calls on hidden Nazis to surrender as Hitler's doomsday draws near. A staggering blow to Nazi hopes of allied disunity is contributed when Secretary of State Hull flies to Moscow, an historic prelude to victory. Commentator is Basil Rysdale. Francis Freed, as the full fury of America's mighty war effort is unleashed. Shattered Nazi armies fall back in disorder and confusion, leaving blazing equipment of shell-torn towns as General Patton's 3rd Army dashes through France toward the Rhine.
Closer and closer to Berlin, the tide of battle flows. Nazi officers, beaten and battle-crazed, are captured. General Eisenhower's brilliant strategy pinches off entire enemy divisions. General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Armies, triumphantly enters Paris. One of his first official acts is to pay homage at the tomb of the unknown soldier as a Garde Militaire, symbol of France reborn, presents arms in salute, and the liberated France rejoices. An historic moment. The vanguard of the American army smashes to the Siegfried Line, invading Western Germany for the first time since Napoleon. Far behind the Nazi lines, 8th and 9th Air Force pilots hit where it hurts. Enemy communications are torn to pieces by American artillery and daring flyers who dominate the skies over Germany. Aachen, first German city to be invaded by Allied armies. Nazi garrison stubbornly refuses to surrender. The destruction of Aachen begins. The ancient capital of Charlemagne's empire is won street by street as the Yanks relentlessly press the attack. Finally, a signal surrender and the city is taken. General Eisenhower, with characteristic simplicity, appears in the front lines to personally commend his G.I. Joes for exploits in battle. Now the weather begins to slow the attack. Rains and floods make progress increasingly difficult bogging down heavy equipment, flooding city streets, and slowing up the Allied advance. The bitter cold and mounting snows handicap the Allied army. Thus the weather becomes a major factor in determining when the Nazis can be beaten into unconditional surrender. British armies slash through the heart of Belgium, outflanking thousands of Germans along the coast. Great events occur after the German debacle and collapse in Normandy. Brussels is taken, and in the Belgian capital, the fall of a hated symbol brings a new hope into the hearts of liberated nations. The joyous people unleash all their pent-up hatred against their Nazi conquerors. This expresses the nation's emotion. Mammoth armada of C-47s and towed gliders disgorges the first Allied airborne army along the Rhine Delta. While from the sea, daring Canadians storm the last gate guarding Antwerp. And other commando units drive inland toward Flushing to seize the Scheldt estuary. The invading Canadians and British experience the most savage fighting of the war during the terrific battle to free the port of Antwerp. But even with time out for compassion, they win the city. A brief moment of peace. In St. Peter's at Rome, Pope Pius creates an historic occasion for Allied soldiers. The apostolic blessing for all, no matter of what creed. And as the Sadist Gestatoria moves slowly and recessional through the crowded aisle, men of every faith press forward to receive personal blessing and to touch the apostolic ring. Russia's mighty armies make new history on the Eastern Front, knocking Romania out of the war, joining with Yugoslav partisans to sweep through Belgrade, tying down huge Nazi forces in Hungary, and finally on the north, invading East Prussia, home of the war-making Junkers. Captured German news films reveal the retreating Nazis desperately attempting to slow down the advancing Russian army by demolishing railroad tracks, warehouses, and supply dumps. In Moscow, the enormous extent of Soviet victories in 1944 is 
partly seen in the spectacular parade of 60,000 Nazi prisoners marching through the city streets and historic Red Square to prison camps nearby. The Marines have landed, and it's a traditional story repeated over and over again, this time in the Marianas, in the battle for vital Saipan. Here is some of the fiercest fighting ever photographed by daring cameramen. Flamethrowers smoke out the frantic jets. There's one afire. Marianas are 1,500 miles from Japan. The island becomes a base for B-29 super fortresses to bomb Tokyo. The Marines are alert when a battle-crazed Jap surrenders. The fight for Saipan increases in fury. Many Nippon soldiers are relentlessly driven back to the top of a cliff where they commit suicide by leaping to the jagged rocks below. to our fighting Marines. Six hundred assault ships sail to make history. General Douglas MacArthur aboard the cruiser Nashville watches the naval attack. Bypassing Mindanao, he catches the enemy in the Philippines completely off balance by landing on Leyte. More than 100,000 men of the 6th Army, commanded by Lieutenant General Walter Krugar, come ashore. Making good his immortal promise, I will return, MacArthur comes ashore with President Sergio Osmena and every living member of the ill-fated garrison who escaped with him from Corregidor. Two years and ten months later, American troops smash inland against the Jap 16th Division, conquerors of Bataan and perpetrators of the horrible March of Death. From the steps of the capital in Tacloban, President Osmena again calls the Philippine patriots to arms. Gun crews on the alert to battle Hitner's flying bombs. They succeed in shooting down 1,500 out of 8,000 one-ton robots. Fighting planes bring down 1,900 more. An average of 100 a day threaten England. One-third of the Nazi secret weapons reach British targets, killing 6,000 people, seriously wounding 17,000 others. British and American gunners perform magnificently. There's a robot, deflected and diving to the ground. A warning of new horrors in any future war. New York's governor, Thomas E. Dewey, campaigns for the presidency with the oft-repeated slogan, it's time for a change. In the final days of the campaign, Franklin D. Roosevelt swings into his fight for a fourth term. As the world watches with amazement, a nation strong enough to take time out for politics in the midst of the greatest war in history. By a majority of three and a half million votes, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is elected to serve for a fourth term. ago that our boys from Jefferson left for training. Although we hated to see them leave, we were a little proud that ours was one of the first National Guard companies to be called up. There were 103 of our boys in the outfit, so 
was quite a chunk out of our small population. We had a little parade for them, and the mothers cried a bit. But we all thought nothing had happened to them. This wasn't our war. The chaps wouldn't dare attack us. Hitler couldn't cross the Atlantic. The boys went to camp and drilled and trained with their old equipment and wrote cheerful letters home about how they could whip anybody when they got their guns. But after a few months, they were a little better trained than the rest of the companies. So they were loaded onto transports and sent out to the Philippine Islands, 5,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean. They arrived safely and soon settled down to life in the tropics. Then came the stab in the back. I suppose, like most people in other towns all over America. We may have been excited at first, but then we became a little more silent and a little more grim because we knew the face of every boy. We watched them grow up. There wasn't a single family in town that wasn't kin to one of the boys in Company A. After the first shock was over, we settled down to life more or less as usual. Mrs. Delaney wrote her John to watch out for malaria because he'd had a touch of it when he was nine. Mrs. Ross baked a cake to send to Milton, but he never got it. And we all went to church more often. We knew some of our boys would die. We didn't know which ones, of course, but everybody tried not to think about it. But the fighting went on just the same. Last winter came the first telegram from the War Department. Alton took it off the wires just before closing time. It was for Mr. and Mrs. Todd, who lived on a farm just outside town. Alton didn't want to deliver it by himself, so he stopped by and got the minister to go with him. Everybody was asleep as they drove up to the Todd's little home. Mr. Todd is over 60, and the missus is not much younger. With their son, they farmed about 50 rich acres of wheat, and Richard had gone two nights a week to the armory. Alton said they looked very lonely as they came out from the porch that night to get the news. The minister read the telegram aloud. Your son, Richard Todd, killed in action. For a day or so, everybody resolved to buy more bonds and to work harder. But the Todds lived on the edge of town, and we didn't see them very often, so we lapsed back into our old ways a bit. We laid off at the factory for a day, wasted our tires, skipped a week on our bonds, we felt like most other towns, the war was a long way off. But the war was to come even closer to us. Manila was evacuated and bombed. Everybody stuck by their radios. We were thinking about our boys. So Christmas came and went, and everybody tried to have a good time thinking about the next Christmas when the boys would be back. Their letters all said, don't worry, Mom, or we're doing all right in this scrimmage. And we had our heroes to celebrate, too. We learned that Steve Johnson, one of our young lawyers, had led the boys in an attack that netted 60 Japs. 
Everybody congratulated Mrs. Johnson, and it was really something to talk about for a few days. But then the retreats began. We knew that things must be getting worse because their letters were getting more cheerful. The boys were trying to keep our spirits up. There were more telegrams. There was one for old man Landry about his grandson, Jamie, who had been an orphan. One for the Whites and the Greenbergs and two for the Dunlaps. The two Dunlap boys had always stuck together. The war was certainly getting closer to us now. We were in the middle of America. We couldn't be bombed. But there was a war right here on our front step. And it came right in the door on the day that Batan fell. We knew that most of the boys had escaped to Corregidor, but all other news was scarce. Somebody started a cruel rumor that they'd all been killed. Though we tried to stop it, people picked up scraps of gossip and passed them on as gospel truth. Poor Mrs. Stone was told three times that her boy was dead. But it wasn't true, so now she just doesn't believe any rumors only what is official from the government. Somebody, instead of hanging out black crepe, put a flag out on the front of their house. And soon they were all over town. We were worried and proud at the same time. But now the fighting was fiercer and more deadly. It was a terrible blow to Dr. Harper that his boy died on the operating table. Killed by a bomb from a Jap plane. Often we got a little desperate in our thinking. How could we give them the things they needed? We wished we could take the comforts we were enjoying in our homes and carry them out to the tropics and give them to our soldiers, as we did when they were kids at the Boy Scout camp down on the river. The war was here now, right here with us in every home in town. This was what we had to fear and what we had to fight. But we could only work a little harder and give and hope and pray. It couldn't get much worse, but it did get worse. of May, in a hell of heat and fever and fighting, Corregidor Fortress surrendered. All the rest of our boys, 92 of them, were swallowed up in one day. They were prisoners of war at the treacherous mercy of the Japs. They were missing in action. We didn't know how many of them were dead. All that night, our people wandered around the streets, from the post office to the courier, down to the depot to get the papers off the train, trying to get some news, trying to get or give some comfort. But very little was to be had. This was war. War brought right here to our little town, forced upon us by an aggressor whom we had helped and tried to trust in the past. Naturally, we couldn't do much of anything for a few days. We couldn't work. We couldn't even sleep. Our two remaining doctors had their hands full, treating people for shock and for old sicknesses, brought back to life by worry and grief. But everybody took it bravely. Mrs. Deering said my boy would be fighting now if he'd had guns and food for his men. The Todds, who would have to farm alone now, said it makes us realize how little we've done to help them. We all wondered, at one time or another, how the rest of America felt. Those who had not lost sons and brothers and fathers, but just a battle. Some of us were disillusioned, and some of us were just plain mad. We tried to make some plans. A committee phoned the Red Cross in New York to see if there was any way to get letters to prisoners of war under the Japanese. 
And the rumor mongers tried to start up again, telling harrowing tales of Japanese atrocities to prisoners. But they didn't get very far. Our minds weren't idle now, so we didn't have time for rumors. We knew the enemy and what he was like. And then things started to happen. Our salvage drives took on new meaning to us because our boys could have used the things we'd been wasting. We didn't keep for ourselves anything that could help our soldiers. And we realized in a way how lucky we were. We were a little ahead of the rest of America. We had learned the full meaning of this war because we had lived with its pain. There was no doubt in our minds now, no complacency, no indecision, no time to think of our own troubles, just time to fight, to work overtime. A lot of the kids went out to the farms to help harvest the crops. Hands were important now, more important than experience. Our high school teacher, a filling station man, and Bill Daniels organized a fix-it committee. They were all handy with tools, so they worked after hours on refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, automobiles. In that way, an aeroplane factory got two more mechanics they needed to make the planes we didn't have at Batan. A shipyard got a welder who helped launch a ship three days ahead of schedule. And there was one more man in America making guns. We all either walked or stayed home and gave up our tires so that our army could roll and our planes could land. We didn't realize how many things we could do that we hadn't done before. We made over our clothes so our soldiers could keep warm. We didn't waste electricity. And the smelters a hundred miles away had more power to make steel. We sent the Navy six pairs of good binoculars. And an Axis raider was sunk in the Atlantic. And we didn't spend our money either. We put it to work to get our boys back home. We weren't going to face them again after all they'd been through without being able to say with a clear conscience, we did everything we could to help you. Not a little bit or more than we thought we had to, but everything, all day in every way we could. And in spite of the gnawing grief that was always inside us, we began to feel a little elated. There was joy in our work because we knew we could face our boys. To those who had given arms and legs and eyes, we could say that we gave not only our sickening luxuries and comforts, but our money, our thought, our skills, our work, and our sweat. It was a different town that watched our second troop march off to war. There were almost 200 of them this time. Some of them weren't as husky as others, but they could help their pals. Yes, we were a different people. We knew that through our efforts, these boys would have guns this time, better guns than the enemy. They'd have food to sustain them, medicine to keep them well. They'd have fast planes, tough tanks, and fleets of ships to keep them supplied. They'd be better than any enemy. Their weapons would be stronger because all the ingenuity and mechanical skill of our whole great nation would be behind them. These boys would never have to surrender because we at home would never let them down. We knew that all America would learn what we had learned the hard way, that this is everybody's war. Not war for an outpost here or a naval base there, but war for every foot of American soil, every home and field, for all our friends, for all our kin. A war without compromise and without quarter. A war that must end only one way, in freedom for the world and for our little town. Your commentator is Basil Risedale. Sensational disaster unrevealed during the war. The British battleship Barham is torpedoed, capsizes. Eight hundred men perish when the magazines explode. Hitler 
Hitler's most terrifying secret weapon, the V-2 rocket, is disclosed. Jet propelled, the V-2 rises faster and faster until a speed of 50 miles a minute is attained. And no defense against it has been discovered. Another V-2 is launched, a weapon that just one year earlier might have changed the entire course of the war. A funeral train rolled slowly past the grief-stricken people of a little town in America. And all over the freedom-loving world, hearts are bowed. All that is mortal of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, four times President of the United States, leaves Washington. Vice President Harry S. Truman takes the oath of office on April 12, 1945, and succeeds to the presidency. At Hyde Park, New York, it is a soldier's funeral, with all honors to the nation's departed commander-in-chief. The last flaming hours for a doomed city. Berlin, once mighty metropolis of a proud nation, now crumbles under the merciless pounding of Russian artillery. The senseless last stand of the Nazis results only in complete devastation. Nazism comes to an ignoble end. General Dwight D. Eisenhower treasures a gift of the pens the Nazis used in surrendering. In Berlin, Eisenhower arrives to attend a momentous meeting which determines the zones of occupation in Germany. General Montgomery signs for Britain. Chukov signs the agreement for the Soviets. General Eisenhower signs for the United States. It is a proud moment for Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Great Britain, as he reviews the victorious Canadian and British troops in Berlin. President Truman, flying to Germany for an Allied conference, salutes an American division. At Potsdam, the President reviews the Army of Occupation, where once the Kaiser's legions paraded. If we can put this tremendous machine of ours, which has made this victory possible, to work for peace, we can look forward to the greatest age in the history of mankind. That's what we propose to do. The flag that flew over the Capitol at Washington on the day of Pearl Harbor is raised at Potsdam. Victory echoes across a thankful Europe as Parisians turn out in holiday mood and General de Gaulle pays tribute to the undying spirit of liberty. Holland is liberated by Canadian armies amidst wild rejoicing. Not even joy over liberation can shake their determination to mete out swift justice. The Dutch relentlessly round up collaborators and whistlings. In Copenhagen, General Montgomery is wildly cheered. And the Danes' heroic King Christian, who never surrendered to the Nazis, receives a tremendous ovation. In Oslo, Norway, Crown Prince Olaf joins in the celebration. Rudolf Hess, third-ranking Nazi before his spectacular flight to Britain, is held for trial. Field Marshal Hermann Goering loses his sidearms and all his arrogance when captured by the American army. Field Marshal von Rundstedt, he advocated the elimination of enemy people by starvation. Marshal Henri Pétain of France is tried in Paris as a traitor and only his advanced age saves him from a firing squad. The hated collaborator Pierre Laval goes on trial and his arguments fall on deaf ears. Swift French justice condemns him to be executed. In Manila, the Jap General Yamashita faces a military court of five American generals. Revolting crimes are charged against him. One of the greatest scenes in American history is filmed on Iwo Jima by a daring cameraman. On the costly battlefields of Okinawa, the final campaign against Japan is fought to a finish. 
Signal Corps, Marine, and Air Force cameramen follow the 10th Army into the Oroku Peninsula in their final mopping up drive that smashes the remnants of once powerful Jap forces. The atomic bomb explodes over Nagasaki, Japan. The Japs were ready to sue for peace when this one bomb wiped the city off the map with reverberations felt politically in every capital of the world. Nagasaki, viewed from the air, is just one tremendous area of ruin. The unconditional surrender of Japan on board the USS Missouri. General MacArthur gives one pen to General Wainwright, the other to Britain's General Percival, an historic moment for all the United Nations. first American occupation troops went to Tokyo, the famed 1st Cavalry Division, Liberators of Manila. The American Embassy, fortunately undamaged amidst the bomb-smashed city, is the headquarters of the Supreme Allied Commander, General Douglas MacArthur. He arrives accompanied by Admiral Halsey, famed commander of the 3rd Fleet. The same flag that flew over Rome and Berlin is raised over Tokyo. At the Korean naval base, the Japs have their Pearl Harbor, but no sneak attacks smashed these once powerful ships. They were challenged to come out and fight. BJ Day halts the redeployment of thousands of troops from Europe to the South Pacific, and the greatest American army in history begins a slow process of demobilization. Ships laden with veterans who smashed the German armies in the west pour into east coast ports. The Saratoga, veteran of eight major carrier actions, brings South Pacific veterans into San Francisco. Navy men too are coming home, and what a thrill. Five million New Yorkers turn out to celebrate Navy Day and cheer President Truman as he passes up Fifth Avenue en route to review the greatest armada of fighting ships ever assembled. Strung out for miles at anchorage in the Hudson River, the fleet thrills vast crowds of spectators thronging Riverside Drive. Here are veterans of historic naval actions, their crews saluting as the President's ship passes, and carrier planes fill the skies overhead. Twenty-one guns from every ship in the fleet is the presidential salute. And there's the great battleship Missouri firing. This is the majestic climax to a light victory on the seven seas. Battle veterans of the mighty naval forces are home at last from the Atlantic, the Pacific, and all the far-flung fighting areas of the greatest war in history. <laughs>